between uh, Ihenye, Gareth, and uh, Shanda Jerry. And I'm sure that uh, Ihenye is absolutely delighted because nothing is, is more wonderful for a professor to see his or her student uh, mature enough to be able to give a, a presentation and, and jointly. And it's what we as professors live for to, to educate the next generation. And, uh, here is absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, Roshande is a graduate teaching assistant and PhD candidate in Spanish in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages, Literature, and Culture. Her current research focuses on Spanish English code switching in the United States, bilingualism, and US Latino studies. She has presented her work at various conferences, the most recent presentation uh, entitled Understanding Identity and Bilingualism in uh, Sandra Cisneros' Car Carmelo. Uh, uh, that, that, that was uh, selected um, to appear in the proceedings of the Pennsylvania Foreign Languages Conference, which was, uh, it was quite well done. Uh, she's also presented on where Spanish and English meet, code switching, in Kilo, Chronicas, uh, and in other places. Aside from her interests, her research interests, Rosanda is currently the president of CMLLC's Graduate Forum and has coordinated different workshops for graduate students on topics such as preparing a CV, writing an abstract, and choosing a dissertation topic. She's a member of the Modern Languages Association and the Linguistics Association of America. And this summer, she will be attending, attending the Linguistics Summer Institute at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has an absolutely wonderful uh, mentor who is uh, uh, very well educated in her discipline, educated in three different countries. She got her BA in Spain in philology, which is uh, the sort of parent discipline of linguistics. <laughs> And uh, she, then she decided she wanted to be educated in England, and so she got an MA, an MED, at the University of Liverpool in 1993. Her thesis was on the use of, of passive forms in Spanish. And then she came to the United States and got an MA in Spanish linguistics in 1994 and a PhD in Spanish Linguistics in 1997 uh, from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I mean, if anyone knows about linguistics, that's one of the best uh, linguistics places uh, you can go to. Her dissertation was entitled Topic, Focus, and Bare Nominals in Spanish. And she became a, an associate professor at Penn State University in 1997. Her research interest re includes uh, syntax pragmatic interface, that interface between those two areas, first language acquisition and bilingualism. She has published more than 20 papers and is the author of a book entitled The Syntax Information Structure Interface, Evidence from Spanish and English. Uh, this was published by Robert She's also co-edited a book entitled Syntax and Non-Sententials, published by John Benvit Benjamin. And she's currently working on bilingual development and code switching. Her most recent article articles are Proto Syntax, Aesthetic uh, Accusative Stage, uh, which she co authored with uh, somebody who's sitting in the audience here, Lydia Elena Provagak. And she's also authored Radical Code Switching in the Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wahoo which is for forthcoming in the Bulletin of Hispanic Studies. Uh, she has won important awards, including the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching, and she's also been awarded a Teaching uh, in ex an Excellence in Teaching Award from the Liberal Arts uh, and Science Colleges. Uh, I have to be extremely grateful to uh, Professor Casiales for her involvement in the Humanities Center's work. Uh, no matter how 
where will we be run our center if important people don't participate in it, then it, it, it lacks legitimacy. And she has been a staunch supporter of the center. She has been a resident scholar. She was a resident scholar in 2003-2004. She has won three of our awards, two Innovative Projects Awards and one Faculty Fellowship Award. She has presented uh, two previous Brown Mark talks. This is her third Brown Mark talk. She has participated in two working groups, one of them for three conse consecutive years, which ended in the publication of a very prestigious book. So uh, we have a, a winning combination here of a professor and her student. So please welcome to the podium both Professor uh, Eugenio Casieles and um, Professor in Making, uh, Rashanda Derrick, who will present on Be Beyond Living La Vida Loca, the status of Spanish in the United States. Thank you so much, and thank you all uh, for coming. Um, so as you probably know, the use of Spanish and English in the same conversation by bilinguals even in the same sentence, it's not limited to um, Ricky Martin uh, song. It's pervasive, and there are a lot of people interested in this phenomenon. And you have some incomplete uh, references in the handout. There, there is a handout if anybody has it. Um, and the reason why there are so many people interested, well, linguists um, would be interested in this phenomenon in mixed utterances because our linguistic theories um, need to account for this data too. So uh, in the same way that a linguistic theory needs to account for the grammar of English and for the grammar of Spanish, if there are mixed uh, sentences, um, they, it would need to account for that data too because when bilinguals mix two or more languages in one sentence, it's not a random mixture. There are grammatical uh, utterances and ungrammatical utterances and we need to explain why. Uh, of course, it's also very important for sociolinguists because we want to know who is doing this, talking to whom, where, when, <coughs> and why. So there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, recent studies and dissertations and books on, on this topic. And so we thought um, that we would share with you some of the issues. I became interested in, in code switching in graduate school. In fact, uh, the paper I presented for my oral exam was in code switching. It's been a long time. And Roshanda is very interested in analyzing some bilingual texts. And so she's going to um, show you now. I think the technology is working. Because we wanted you to hear these texts. One thing is to see the mixture, but another thing is to hear. So we have an audio file and a video file. And if we have time, we'll um, show them mm -hmm. uh, to you. So she, she would like to share some of the text that she's thinking about analyzing and which analysis she's thinking about doing, which includes both a linguistic analysis and a sociolinguistic analysis. So I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about the name and some definitions, uh, what linguistic phenomena is involved in um, this, and uh, then um, you're going to talk about the attitudes. And we'll give you some examples. Um, you have some examples in the handout. We're not going to go over all the examples, but you have them. You can enjoy them and take them home with you. Um, and uh, feel free to jump in at any time. So um, Spanish, uh, as you know, it's a blend of Spanish and English. And it's supposed to have been coined by a Puerto Rican writer, um, Salvador Pio, in the late 40s. Of course, it's not alone. Um, there are many glitches or glitches uh, with many languages. You probably know about some of these blends, and you have some also an incomplete list uh, in number one. So there's nothing really special in that sense. Um, there are also other blends that do not end in glitch. So it's uh, in, in number two, you have other possibilities. And to refer to this mixture of Spanish and English, there are also other names. Um, Inglenol has not been so successful um, as Spanglish. Nobody seems to like that. And then depending on the particular 
um, region, there are other possibilities, like the ones you have in four. And in fact, in, um, this is for the United States in particular, but um, Spanish and English are also in contact in Gibraltar, where we have Andalusian Spanish in contact with British English. And in that case, it's referred to as Llanito. So they don't use um, the word. Uh, if you Google Spanish, uh, you will find that it's a movie. Uh, apart from that, and the movie, as far as I remember, has nothing to do with this phenomenon, but once you go past the movie uh, part, uh, you'll find a lot of information, and now there's very interesting, in fact, videos uh, on YouTube, and, uh, uh, that, and we're going to show uh, a little bit later um, part of this. But uh, it has been included in dictionaries recently, uh, some of these definitions uh, you have one example in six, uh, refer to the use of borrowings, and we're going to talk a little bit later about the difference between borrowings and code switching and code mixing. And some are a little, um, they, are, they don't contain any negative word or any evaluation, they're kind of neutral. Others, and you have an example um, in seven, for instance, the Real Academia Española, the um, Royal Academy of the Language, has recently accepted Spanglish with an E, of course. Um, and it describes it, but it adds this word deforming. So it's already saying that this is a deformation of something. Um, and in fact, later, you'll see one of the quotes that we have with certain attitudes uh, where the ex-director of the Royal Academy and who is now director of the Cervantes Institute has referred to the Spanish in the United States as being contaminated. So um, there are different ways to describe and define this phenomenon. Uh, we would also like to say a few words about what Spanish is not. Uh, so um, Spanish is not a mixed language at least not yet. There are a few mixed languages in the world. Around 10 linguists are not sure about some of them. But one of them um, includes Spanish, and it's called media lengua. And you have an example in 10 where Quechua and Spanish have been merged so that um, they use Spanish words and Quechua grammar, which is a uh, very interesting phenomenon, but Spanglish is not there yet. Um, it's also important to distinguish Spanglish uh, from what has been referred to as junk or mock Spanish. So we're not talking about things like no problemo or el tipo. Oh, that's not what we're talking about um, today. There has been a lot of controversy with uh, Elon Stavans, but I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to skip this. If you uh, know about him and about his book and about his dictionary and about the attitudes and you want to talk about that later, we can do that. But um, he has tried to defend Spanish from attacks, but he has not done a very good job according to some people because he has come up with this mixture that is quite artificial. And so people are saying, that is not what bilinguals do. But you have there a link to a YouTube video of a talk by him that is quite interesting, if you want to listen um, to that. Uh, so linguists, and now I'm moving on to number two. Um, linguists usually don't use the word Spanish. It's not a linguistics term. And the reason we don't use it is because it's a mixture of different phenomena in linguistics. So bilinguals that mix the two languages sometimes use uh, long words, sometimes use cogs, sometimes semantic extensions, code switching, code mixing. So we uh, distinguish between those. And um, very quickly, we have some examples of each of these um, phenomena. So in 13 and 14, you have some examples of long words. 
um, there are certain bilinguals in the United States that would use, for instance, troca uh, for camión, and so they're borrowing track and adapting it phonetically and morphology, morphologically to Spanish. Um, I'm going to skip nouns borrowings right now, um, but if you want to talk about that, we can do um, that later. Um, calcs, so those are translations, so sometimes they would translate a phrase from English into Spanish, and uh, from high school they'll talk about Escuela Alta, which is a li literal translation. So instead of borrowing it and saying high school, for instance, which would be possible, they just translate it, so that those are calcs. Uh, semantic extensions is when you convert a false cognate into a real cognate and you add a meaning that that word doesn't have in, in your language. So for instance, um, they might use carpeta to mean carpet in addition to folder, which is what it usually means for monolingual um, speakers. And um, they switch languages, that's referred to as code switching, and I have included for your entertainment some comments from a comedian that also has written a book about Spanglish, uh, in which um, you will have that later in 31, 33, and 34. And I'm not going to talk about it much, but I wanted you to see it because in the same way that some people are criticizing Spanglish, he is defending the label and criticizing the label code switching, and he does it in a very funny way. So I included that um, later. So. Um, even when we're talking about switching languages and not about long words or calcs or semantic extensions, there has been a difference between code switching and code mixing. Um, so uh, code switching is usually used when you switch to a different language, um, which in, you have an example in 20. And code mixing, uh, you have an example in 21, and this is uh, different because you, you, you're not switching from a language to another language, but you are constantly using words from both languages together. And Roshonda later is also going to talk about a different way <coughs> to look at this from uh, Moiskin's um, typology. So those are the linguistic phenomena uh, involved in the in Spanglish. And um, in uh, section three, you have some examples of where you can find this type of mixed discourse. It's everywhere, um, from literary works, of course, poetry. Uh, it's been used for, for a very, very long time. And people, even the people that don't like Spanglish and criticize Spanglish, they don't have a problem with poetry. If you're a poet, you can do whatever you want, and it's fine. And they would not call that Spanglish. But outside of poetry is when people are starting to feel nervous about this mixing. And there's people feeling nervous from the monolingual English speakers in the United States and also monolingual Spanish speakers in Spain and other countries. Um, and there are 40 million potential speakers, so that's why they're getting a little bit worried um, about English and or Spanish. I'm not going to go through all the examples here, but as you can see, there are examples from magazines, from commercials. You might have seen the latest Taco Bell um, commercial at the Super Bowl. Um, songs um, and all kinds of different uh, media. And you have there the quote I was telling you about uh, by this comedian where he criticizes the term code switching. And I think he's partly right. Code switching is really not a very good term. Um, but we can talk about that also if you have some comments. And so if you want, uh, you can continue talking about the different adjectives. We have some quotes here. Some of them are outrageous, as you can see. Uh, and we have both negative and positive um, attitudes. So from the negative attitudes, um, which you can see under number four, um, some bilingual speakers believe that they show poor competence in one or both languages, that Spanglish doesn't make any sense, that it's detrimental to Hispanics in the U.S. and to Spanish in the U.S., and that it's a hodgepodge and a sign of confusion. 
And if you look at the examples, you see words like chronic illness, um, contaminated, um, mental, mental retardation. On the other side, um, some of the positive attitudes um, are, see, they see Spanglish as an expression of self-identity and com community membership. Uh, some people believe that it fills important cultural and conversational functions, and that bilinguals use Spanglish um, uh, as a creative style of bilingual communication. And in the examples, we see um, double the vocabulary, Spanglish is the future, um, and there's an interesting quote from Gloria Anzaldúa, which she says, until I am free to write bilingually and to switch codes without having always to translate, while I have to speak English or Spanish when I would rather speak Spanglish, and as long as I have to accommodate the English speakers rather than having them accommodate me, my tongue will be illegitimate. I will no longer be made to feel ashamed of, uh, of existing. I will have my voice, Indian, Spanish, white. I will have my serpent's tongue, my woman's voice, my sexual voice, my poet's voice. I will overcome the tradition of silence. So we hear, see here that um, authors like Anzaldúa see Spanglish as a way of expressing her authentic identity. And um, now I'd like to move on to talk about the next question, which is, why do we use Spanglish? Why do we use code switching? Why do people code switch? Um, and it's important to note that when we're talking about code switching, we're talking about people that are competent in two or more languages. So we're not talking about student learners, we're not talking about people that maybe took a couple of years of one language in high school. We're talking about people that use these languages on a regular basis for, in their daily lives. So Grosjean gives uh, different reasons as to why bilingual speakers code switch. And the first one, he says, is it is used to fill a lexical gap or to use the most appropriate word. So this means when bilingual speakers are in conversation or interacting with each other, that sometimes, um, as we saw with one of the examples from the positive attitudes, twice the vocabulary, sometimes there's a word from one of the languages that's most appropriate uh, for what they're talking about, which could trigger a code switch. Uh, another one is to discuss certain topics which are better expressed in one language than the other. So for example, uh, let's say we had a group of high school students um, in the U.S. who spoke both Spanish and English. Uh, if they were talking about maybe school, for example, since they're taught in English, they might code switch to English from Spanish because we know that uh, bilinguals use different languages in different contexts. Um, another one is fixed greetings which could also trigger uh, code switching. Various functional uses like quotations, emphasis, clarification. And here we see um, that bilinguals sometimes switch languages to put emphasis on something, uh, to include certain people in conversations, or to exclude people from certain conversations. Um, if that person weren't bilingual, then they wouldn't understand what was going on. Uh, in group solidarity, uh, is when bilinguals like to assert their identity as um, bilinguals. And also to show authority, um, and the quote that I just read from Gloria Anzaldúa, in her text she talks about um, English as a language of power and Spanish as a language of tenderness. So certain bilinguals see the use of either one language or the other um, as something that could show different levels of power and authority. And so for my dissertation, I'm interested in looking at this idea of code switching in literary texts and different medias like songs, magazines, novels, uh, blogs, emails, um, from both the sociolinguistic and grammatical perspective. So on the sociolinguistic side, I'm interested in looking at global and local functions. And when we talk about local functions, these are functions that we can see in the text or in the discourse in whatever interaction we're talking about. And um, it creates meaning for the people that are interacting with it. So like we just discussed on the other slide about um, functional uses, these local functions are things that we can see in the text. And Gumpers, for example, says that code switching can be used to quote, emphasize, clarify, elaborate, um, and it can be triggered by a word used for comedy, irony, or word or language play. 
Johnson, on the other hand, with her research, she adds on that um, this code switching gives emphasis, adds another level of meaning, clarifies, evoke richer images, adds humor, marks closeness, emphasizes, or on the contrary, marks distance and exclude. On the other hand, the global functions um, are functions that we really can't see directly in the text. So here we're seeing uh, a move from code switching, which are just switches, to um, the interaction being more marked as a mixed uh, discourse. And Johnson's research finds that both code switching and code mixing um, show resistance, uh, challenges and transform power relationships and domination, and it has the ability to reconstruct and construct hybrid third space identities for bilinguals. So on the grammatical side, um, I'm interested in using uh, both Meyer-Scotten's typology of the matrix language framework in addition to um, Muskin's uh, categories for code switching, which he proposes. And the first one is alternation. And here we see code switching um, in terms, meaning we start with one language and then switch to another. And then your example, we have some examples up here. I don't know if there's another one on here. Um, insertion happens when we have um, lexical items or phrases that are inserted into um, uh, discourse in another language. And you have an example there with the Spanish uh, with the English being inserted into the Spanish. And the last one, uh, which is also termed as, I guess you could say, code mixing, he calls congruent lexicalization. And this happens when two languages have a shared structure and um, lexical items can be inserted from either language into the structure. So here you see um, kind of everything mixed in together, which kind of leads me on to page five which is a recent text um, titled Killer Cronicas. Uh, it's authored by Susanna Chavez-Silverman. And I'm really interested in analyzing this particular text because as you can see in examples 38 and 39, um, it, it's very mixed, which means it doesn't have a matrix language. So we can't tell if it is an English text with Spanish words inserted into it, or if it's a Spanish text with English words inserted into it. So I'm really interested in this idea of um, this linguistic variety of Spanglish as an unmarked choice, an unmarked mode of communication for this author. And this particular text originally started as emails that she had sent back and forth to friends and family members, which she eventually had published. So I'm really interested in looking uh, at a text like this one and comparing it to other texts like uh, those authored by Juno Diaz in which there's a clear matrix language, which is English, with Spanish being inserted into it. So in addition to some written examples, I have um, some oral texts that I'd like for us to listen to. The first one we're going to listen to comes from Killer Cronicas. Um, and if you go to page, I guess, 6, you'll see the text that you're about to hear. Professionals. De repente, un olor que no había sentido en más de un año rises in la coastal breeze and hits me. No, it strokes me, full in la cara, sage. Ah, oh, it's the North American Southwest. Ah, salvia, tan green and subtle and gorgeous. I smart with tears and I wince. Sigh. I should be prepared para estas overpowering waves of emotion. Siempre he sido así. You're too sensitive, me decían de niña. So impressionable, me dicen siempre. En Buenos Aires, supe que aunque tengo mi sunshine in Aries, está en la casa cuatro, ruled by cancer, that mushy-hearted, timid, sidewinding crustacean. Y tengo, por si eso fuera poco, a Mercurio en Pisces en la casa tres. Y eso me explica a veces. 
It means you have ESP, baby, me dijo, esa vidente en New Orleans. Y Beatriz, la astróloga que me hizo la primera carta astral en Buenos Aires, me dijo, tus sueños tienen el poder de pronosticar. Pero de confirm cosas que he venido incluyendo all my life. El olfato me lleva y me trae por la vida desde siempre. The full throttle charge of it, immediate and nostalgic, a la vez. Un poquito después del sage llega otro olor dulzón, casi empalagoso, chilly and night blooming jasmine. Oh, esos delicate, innocuous, pale pink blooms, que de día no huelen a nada, ahora overpower me, casi jaqueca strong. Y luego, still later, esa shush, shush, son las olas. De ellas no podré nunca vivir lejos mucho tiempo. Me vuelvo loca, in a way, en el interior. Even if I'm by a river, that huge camel-colored Río de la Plata, or my beloved Mississippi, or the icy Charles. Y válgame Dios if it's a really high and dry place, sin río siquiera, tipo Madrid, or Pretoria, el interior. Me vuelvo un poco stir-crazy. Pero even a big river is just not the same as this shh. My Pacific, that marine dam, mis cabellos rizados and my butt muscles pulsing, stinging on this fast, long-legged Venice night walk, del auto a la casa de mi entrañable amiga Paquita, to the non-sleeping teen slumber party, and later, one of Paquita's paperback murder mystery novels, just to lull myself into a dull, lonely sleep. And back, <coughs> honey, I'm home without you all. Poetas, amigas, poetas, amigas. <coughs> What's the difference? I, where am I? So as you can see, um, a text like this one, which we don't know, is it an English text, <coughs> is it a Spanish text, um, is very interesting because it's only understood by bilinguals. So if you are a monolingual English speaker, you probably didn't understand much of it, and if you're a monolingual Spanish speaker, then you probably wouldn't understand much of it either. So another text I'm interested in analyzing, if you flip back to page five, is a YouTube video, which unfortunately we don't have internet connection to see the video, but I can play the audio. And this one is different from the previous one because it's, it's an English text which has more, uh, it has Spanish insertions. So it's not working? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought it was fixed. Mm -hmm. Diego speak no Spanish, because Daddy's Spanish is not fluent. See? You have the text on page five. Entiendo mucho, pero the words do not always come out the same way they come in. Do you get this? Me who speak no Spanish. Bring count to ten. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. It's more like uno. Dos, tres, cuatro. Mi hijo tries hard, uh, and his abuelo smiles, approving him. He is working. On a hundred now, ten. He responds lovingly to me, and can pronounce his middle name, Roberto. Not Roberto or Roberto, or any other form. Because his mother could not speak it to him. 
things were changing. Man. Behold, you come from many cultures, many a living. But know that these roots run deep into the land of spirits. Chihuahua, Mexico, El Valle de San Luis, Coronado. Influenced by España, pero primero y siempre indígena. Mi bisabuela was a curandera, Dara Umara, a wise woman, healer. This is your history, Mijo. We come from a long line. Yes. <laughs> the video is very nice. It's on YouTube. That's the link. Uh, if you want to listen to it, and he has other rapping monologues of this type where he talks about. One is called um, "Brown is Beautiful." That's mm -hmm. a nice one too. Is he only known as Molina? Yes, Molina. Molina speaks. Molina he speaks. has a web page. He performs a lot. Um, he sent you the lyrics. Yes. He's very happy. And a Facebook request. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you have anything else that you'd like to Well, add? since we have time, um, maybe I can um, go back to, or oh, do you want to finish that first? Or are you, do you want to add something now? Or? Um, no, the only thing I was going to say is if any of you know of any bilingual texts that maybe would help my analysis for my dissertation or any theoretical frameworks that I might consider um, to analyze my data, that would be very helpful. Or if you guys have any opinions or thoughts about Spanglish, any attitudes of your own, we'd love to hear them. Other than that? Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add something about what I skipped so far. I don't want to take too much time, but since we have um, a few minutes. Um, on page two, um, I didn't talk about the non sparrowing and this is a concept that is quite controversial because some people say we don't need that. And so I, I wanted to tell you a little bit uh, about it. Um, so in the 70s and 80s, uh, some linguists were coming up with constraints um, ad hoc constraints to explain mixed utterances. And for instance, some of the uh, more famous are Poplar's uh, equivalent constraint or the uh, free morphine constraint, and they, they were trying to uh, account for why some switches were grammatical and some, some switches weren't. And what happened was that there was all this data from different languages uh, showing that what seemed to be uh, a constraint wasn't. So in reply to those criticisms, say, no, no, um, in this uh, sentence, you can have that. It's OK. You don't have to have equivalent structures. You can have two morphemes, uh, bound morphemes together. Popla came up with this idea of a non sparrowing by saying, well, those are not really switches. That's why they don't follow the constraints, because they are really, they look like switches. Uh, but they are really borrowings. It's just that they are not borrowings that have been established in the community yet. They're just temporary borrowings. So that she called them non-sparrowings. And people, I think most linguists are saying, wait a minute, that's really a switch. So, and part of why we wanted you to hear uh, some of this data is because in order to distinguish between a borrowing and a switch, you'll, you need to hear it. Uh, so usually, um, a switch, you're switching uh, languages, so you're switching pronunciation, but when you're borrowing a word, you will adapt it. So for instance, in an in example like I have in 16, if I say, todavía no tiene tenure, and I try my best at pronouncing tenure in a, in a way that it sounds native, I am switching languages. But if I say, todavía no tiene tenure, Am I switching or am I borrowing tenure? And it all depends on my pronunciation in English, because if I'm the kind of person, a second language learner of English, that would say in English, um, he doesn't have tenure, then you can compare tenure and tenure. But if my English would be something like, he doesn't have tenure, <laughs> then we don't know if when I say tenure, it's because that's my English pronunciation, or it's because I am 
borrowing it, uh, even though it's not part of the community. So the difference between borrowing and, and switching is not as straightforward as you would think. Uh, and that's why we have this notion, um, particularly when you um, have just one word and you don't have the pronunciation, you don't know if you're switching just for one word, but like inserting would be in Moiskin's mm -hmm. typology, or if you're really just borrowing this word. So I just wanted to clarify that um, concept. Do you want to add something else before? No, I don't think so. Okay, so Thank we'll just much. let you tell us what you think about um, Spanglish or any other mixture because many of the issues uh, would be the same for the mixture of different uh, languages. So any ideas, comments, questions are welcome. Uh, something that really struck me on the first uh, <laughs> cut that you played mm -hmm. is um, the phonology is, I mean, it, it's like turning a switch. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she's got American R's, she's got all, all Native American, Native Midwest or what, I couldn't tell, Western American phonology, and then she switches and she's got trills and mm -hmm. the vowels all change shape. I haven't heard that kind of clean switching much. Is, is that unusual? Is it's common. It's very common. This is what bilinguals are doing. So she's just she's very good at it. I met her at a conference, and she was speaking Spanish to me, of course. Um, and she, in fact, has different varieties of Spanish in, because she was living in Argentina and Spain, and she's Mexican American Jewish. Uh, she's a very interesting so she person. Threw a, she threw a veteo in, in the middle of what's Yes, Otherwise sometimes she when she's American. talking about Spain, she uh, uses the theta like we do, mm -hmm. and when she's talking about Argentina, jo. Yeah, I heard one of those too. Right, mm -hmm. so she's very, she's using all her possibilities. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing apropos, you know, what's, what's, what's the target is this guy Molino is not speaking standard American English, but he speaks English. At least to my ears, he's speaking African American flavor, and it's not it's far English. end of the of the continuum. But it's it's clearly to my ears an African American flavor. He's African. Uh, I well, unfortunately, we couldn't see the picture, but mm -hmm. I was guessing. Mm -hmm. Or is he? He sounds it. Yeah, it's just based on on phonology. What's the <coughs> sort of stance you're taking is this is this uh, you're, you're describing this variety as a, a language in itself or is it uh, you're looking at it as one of the contact phenomena because I asked that question because you asked about suggesting frameworks for analysis you know, the framework which immediately came to mind if this was particular kind of stance was the, it's an old framework, but it's, it's always useful to sort of the page uh, identity model, which um, she look at, um, I mean, the best example is in the, in the Belize uh, studies, in which she looked at um, Spanish and Creole in English, and I forgot the Armenian language that was all involved, and then people, as they spoke, they, they switched to, uh, to, 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 to various linguistic manifestations of one or other of the identities. And, and that, that was uh, comfortable for him because he didn't, he didn't look at he looked at it more as code switching than anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, if your stance is this is a, a, a language in itself, uh, that model might not be particularly helpful. But if it isn't, then with the page Tabara Keller um, acts of identity model uh, would be an interesting framework to to, to use, or, or at least it would could, could, could provide a theoretical um, 
ethos within which to locate this kind of work. Okay. Of course, in the discussion of said media language, there's a mm -hmm. student who wrote an absolutely wonderful paper in the class recently. I'm teaching this course on visual code, you listen to it. You know, Moiskin's article on, on media lingua, it's supposed to be the best. But uh, she looked at uh, somebody by Paul Shapiro, I think, who's, who challenged that and saw that there was much more mixing. Um, so you might want to look at that particular article to see, because uh, media lingua wasn't in, in, in this, in this uh, presentation, is seen as this clean break between uh, Spanish words and Quechuan grammar. Mm -hmm. There was much more mixing, mm -hmm. and there were texts which indicate that mixing. So that, that, is, a, that is a kind of framework. about uh, long words or borrowing. So um, they are, they take Spanish morphology, right? When, when an English word is, is borrowed, does it, do you add some Spanish morphology to it? Yes, they, they are adapted phonetically and morphologically. Okay. And, and uh, does it ever happen in the opposite? Uh, that the, in the, uh, uh, the Spanish ever, a Spanish word ever gets adopted to the English morphology, or is it what asymmetric? Is yeah, when English say, you know, I want a burrito, they don't say burrito, right? So they're adapting the Spanish or patio or pronunciation. Pronunciation, right. But the, um, do they ever, uh, does it ever get um, English morphology? I don't know. The Sometimes, for instance, in Spain, people uh, talk about uh, footing, which means go jogging. Okay. And they talk about puenting, which is when people jump off bridges. <laughs> uh, there is uh, a company called Vueling, Vueling, which is flying in Spanish. So the ING seems to be particularly mm -hmm. appealing for some reason, and it's it's even used when in, for words that English monolinguists would. I I don't think in America you say footing right at all. So or pointing, absolutely. <laughs> A day is parking too. Parking, yeah. You have to say parking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I call those even code. That's no, those just are borrowings. Spanish borrow with English borrowings. Yeah. But but you certainly I mean you have lots of examples of English words integrated into Spanish with Spanish morphology mm -hmm. clearly being generated online. So the question is do you get Spanish words with mm -hmm. English morphology yeah. generated online? So I was uh, I was a bla I was a blaring with someone, or a bling, a bling. I don't know how you do that. Maybe that's the problem: is that the Spanish comes with lots of morphology stuck on. Right, we have too much morphology to start with, so uh, it would be hard to add any English morphology. But um, for things like troca or yarda or switch, I mean, nouns in Spanish have to be feminine or masculine. They have to have an article. So you need to make them Spanish um, in order to pronounce them and also for them to agree with, with other words. Of course, if they're plural, you can't tell whether it's English or Spanish because they have the same plural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it strikes me that there is more, more of that going um, in one direction yes. than in the other. Yes. And uh, Serbish is, is the same way, uh, right. which is what I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so English words are roots are taken, and uh, morphology is added from Serbian. Right. right, never the other way around. Right. So it's still you can say it's still Serbian with a lot of English borrowings mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Right, so. and for Spanish there is a little bit of both. For instance, um, the Greek ones like Oscar Wilde is basically English, 
but he just massively borrows from Spanish and on purpose, I mean, he has said that this is his revenge on English, <laughs> publicly. Uh, so that's totally different from a text that is mainly Spanish with some English influence and totally different from what Susana um, Tabas Hilleman is trying to do. She's trying to have a totally bilingual text so that you cannot, you cannot establish a matrix language, basically. Mm -hmm. So. And that seems to be approaching, I mean, if this is successful, we still don't know, but seems to be approaching our idea of this fused left and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, becoming a mixed language, it's, mm -hmm. it's possible. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the, uh, I didn't, I'm not a football fan, so I didn't watch the Super Bowl, and I didn't, oh, hear, I didn't, either. I didn't hear the Taco Bell. I was told. <laughs> um, but I, I'm interested in the teeny tiny uh, kind of uh, code switch of live mas. The, yes. the Iroquois, I think that that's wonderful. It's so tiny, two mm -hmm. syllables, right. that I, I'm wondering, I, I want to go on YouTube and listen to it because I can't imagine that someone could switch between syllables from a English phonology uh, toolkit to a this Spanish analogy. I, I, look, yeah, I looked for it <coughs> on YouTube myself, and it's never said in the commercial. Oh, it, it it's here. It's just written. Oh, oh, okay. And the name of the commercial also has Viva Young. Oh. So <laughs> it's called Viva Young, and it's about this. Uh, oh, have you seen the commercial? No, nobody no, has. No. Yeah, I only looked for it because I was told, hey, there's some Spanish there. I said, okay, okay. Um, but it's never pronounced. Because I don't see how you could. It seems like it would have to be pronounced either with Spanish phonology or with English phonology, since it's just two syllables. <laughs> I tend to think of some code switching as like changing gears in a car. Yeah. You, you can't <clears throat> do it every step. You have, once you've changed gears, it takes a second to exactly. change them again. For some people, it doesn't but it because doesn't seem they to. have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you have been brought up monolingually, then even though I'm sure most of us can switch all the time uh, and we, we use mm -hmm. two languages on a daily basis, that's different from when somebody has been brought up bilingually and the community has been brought up bilingually and they're used to switching back and forth because mm -hmm. all the members of the community are bilingual. And they're so fast. I mean, if you listen to this, you can say, like, wow, how, how could they do that? Um, so I think it is certainly possible. Uh, and I was just going to add, I like the metaphor of the, and I think it's in one of these examples, of the 12 string guitar, mm -hmm. as opposed to two, six oh, string <laughs> instruments. So I think that's a good way to put it. I have a question I'm just looking at on page six here. Uh, I noticed they're using the, the Spanish articles with English words, Tuna uh, movie, La Costa Breeze, El Interior. Um, is, can you talk about how gender gets assigned when you have mm -hmm. English words? In it? Yeah, well, that's a problem that uh, in Spanish, when we borrow words from other languages, you have to give them a gender. And there are some uh, investigations about how do you decide? Does it depend on what if, if it ends in an R, you know, you have more possibilities of being uh, feminine. It also uh, depends on if you translate it, would the, for instance, if you want to borrow internet, you have to decide if it's el internet or la internet or any word um, you borrow. But that example you mentioned is interesting because one of the uh, constraints that uh, were proposed, I think this one was in the 80s after Poplar's constraints, was the um, head functional constraint. And in that constraint, um, some linguists were noticing that you couldn't, for instance, switch between a complementizer and the IP, the inflection, or between a determiner and a noun phrase. Now, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of counterexamples mm -hmm. where there's a determiner in one language, like the example you were mentioning, and the noun in the other language. And some people will claim, well, are you really switching? <laughs> or is it that a noun, I think, can be immediately 
insert it if you want to talk about switching or borrow if you want to talk about non-sparrowing. Um, I think anywhere. So that's why you have to distinguish between all these types of switching like Moiskin has done because if it's insertion, you can pretty much insert anything anywhere. And, and on that too, uh, back to the, the, in, the inwards, are all the inwards the same gender? Do all, all inwards take masculine? Or? I think they say el puentín, el putín. Jose Antonio, what do you think? Yeah, that tends to, I have never seen la in. Can you think of an example of la? And this might be different in different countries. I don't know if uh, Victor has some examples from Puerto Rico. No, it just works that way. Yeah. All the French words borrowed with in are all masculine. Yeah. And they're almost the same words to the fucking, I don't know about fucking, the fucking. Because that means a parking. It means it means a multiple-story parking lot. Yes, in Spain. Same in Spain. Parking. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think that the I don't have any background in linguistics, but I it just occurred to me after hearing this that I was remarking this gentleman earlier. I, I once went to Montreal and I went to a conference, and I heard a coat checker speak to one guy in in French. But I'm in perfect English. And then when I got up, suddenly he didn't know any English. And I got this, this feeling that, you know, I was the American, so I had to know the, uh, I had to know the French real quick. But suddenly I had to come up. I was in their country. And it got me to thinking about the defensiveness of languages, this sense of, you know, you either speak it correctly, or you don't speak it, or you don't speak it at all, or you speak it properly, or if you're, in, there's this political aspect to language. And I wondered if, if where two cultures are meeting with border towns and the things like this, where Spanish and English are meeting, is, is there a, a political undertone beneath all this cultural exchange that maybe kind of rattles a bunch of people who don't really don't like this, this purity being destroyed? Yes, and we didn't talk about um, the political aspects, the cultural and social aspects. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the April um, conference. But you're right, um, um, apart from the linguistic and social linguistic aspects, this is a political issue. And I did mention, for instance, the English only uh, movement in the United States and the purists in Spain and other countries having a problem with this. Um, because for some of these people, this is who they are. They are not Spanish, they are not English, they are a mixture. And they want to establish that that's their identity. So it's very important. And that's why I think that no matter how many people and some linguists are starting doing that, um, I was surprised, but no matter how many people tell um, the Latinos and Hispanics that are doing this to stop doing that because it's wrong and it doesn't make any sense and you're destroying Spanish, I'm, I'm not sure they will because that exactly expresses who they are. Because then this contact sort of messes up the political control, the language that has a power that if these two people interact so easily, that messes up their control a lot. What is it called in Spanish when they have the punctuation on both ends of the phrase? And what? Oh. <laughs> and, 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 what is, and what is it called if you put any other language and just borrow the punctuation? Like if you put any other language inside of Spanish punctuation, is there any terminology for that? Orthographic code switching. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke. Um. <laughs> well, I do realize, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Which is being but, cute. But in Spanish, the, you know, the punctuation is different. They have punctuation. Yeah, yeah. In what Spanish, that? you have to have for question mark and exclamation mark at the beginning and at the end. That's different from. And English. what's the word for that in Spanish? That, that, the phenomenon that they have the punctuation either end? It's, it's the question mark. They don't they don't differentiate between the, the, the first punctuation mark and the second punctuation mark? Uh, the computer will have it. 
Oh, I realize there's no uh, different. There's no like different the initial for, exclamation no, point no, and no, the final exclamation point. There's no word for an upside down exclamation point. No, when we say point, exclamation point points, that means the beginning and the end. You could so say we initial, might say like I guess. Of initial. Initial point. In the upside down question mark, there's no, there's no word, special word for that? No. no. But it's interesting because when we were kind of joking doing this, I realized that muchas thank yous, I hear all the time say, as a joke. You just say, instead of saying muchas gracias, you just say, oh, muchas thank yous. <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> I just out of curiosity, uh, uh, has it been studied uh, how or, or whether uh, for users of Spanglish, whether their level of competence in either language, English or Spanish separately, how it impacts the, the actual use of Spanglish. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, I mean, it's interesting in this poem, uh, which is a wonderful poem where the father says, mi hijo speaks no Spanish because that is Spanish is not fluent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know uh, it is the case for many native Native Spanish speakers, uh, that in fact their Spanish is, is better than their Spanish or their English. Uh, as, yeah, I guess I'm just asking if that has been studied. Yes. In uh, so, balanced bilinguals, um, so those that two languages are pretty balanced and they could speak monolingually to either, either uh, uh -huh. um, Spanish speaking people or English speaking people tend to do more <clears throat> of the mixed type. So they are more, um, they can mix them like Susana does. Well, in Molina, for instance, uh, if you look at this text, you'll see that it's basically English, but he just adds abuelo for grandfather, abuela for grandmother, mijito. So it's just a few, it's mostly insertions. I don't know if there's any real switch but so there's definitely um, a difference and and also um, something interesting about Spanish <clears throat> is that there is not one Spanish so Mexican Americans don't do the same uh, that New Yorkans or um, other um, Latinos so there's also there's an inherent variation uh, depending on the type of um, society and, and the First of all, because their Spanish is different to start mm -hmm. with, Mexican Spanish is different from Caribbean Spanish, uh, but also because some of these um, borrowings tend to vary from community to community. So it might, it might not be a language yet, but it already has the variation. <laughs> uh, it has the dialect sound, for sure. Could it, could it be the nature of English being a borrowing language? Because it's, I've heard it said that English is always borrowing all the time. Now, I don't know if that's true for Spanish uh, or, or other languages as such, but I've heard that English just, I mean, we just take words from other languages all the time. So it seems more natural in English. I don't know how it sounds in Spanish, but it just seems like it becomes part of and. Thank you mucho sounds, you know, sounds when you're monolingual you. sounds like you're, you're imitating Spanish, but, but it, it does make me think about the, the borrowing aspects of the English language and maybe they, that aspect is sort of resisted in Spanish. Yeah, all languages are borrowed from other languages and it has happened, I mean, Latin borrowed from Greek and borrowing is just a phenomenon that it's, it's, uh, applies, I think, there are many linguists in this room, so they might want to say something about it, too. Um, so it's a perfectly natural phenomenon, not only for English, but I think what's happening nowadays, because of the influence of English as a lingua franca, and in, the, in, in, in terms of the technology, the sports, the TV, the media, all the languages are borrowing certain um, phrases. Um, young people want to be cool, and they say it so in Spain. 
things like that. So because of the status of English, I think, uh, other languages, and some people are getting nervous, it's true, um, about this, um, the French in, in particular, and, uh, but, yeah. There is, I mean, some people have claimed, and I think with some justification, that, that some languages are more or less resistant to borrowing, mm -hmm. with English being, having very low defenses. Well, um, if you don't have much morphology, it's also yeah. easier yeah. to welcome mm -hmm. all these words. But there are, and then there are other, even European languages that have been much more resistant. French is much more resistant to borrowing than German. At least French of France is much more resistant to borrowing than, say, German. Um, <coughs> and I, I, I think it's Icelandic. No, I'm, I'm, I'm blank. There, there, I think Chinese it's, is resistant to borrowing. Yeah. The, and some languages just say, okay, well, we'll take your morphemes and translate them morpheme by morpheme and make great big long weird words that, that come from English but don't look like they do. Uh, German used to do that. In the 19th century, German didn't borrow anything. They took words like phonology and uh, linguistics and converted them morpheme by morpheme. So you got Lautlehre instead of phonology and Sprachwissenschaft instead of linguistics. But in the 21st century, they've given up on that entirely. Say das Computer, das Hard Drive. Yes. The way forward for this research, uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Now, the, the, the texts that you have are all from one community, say, um, because what I'm thinking of is uh, here you have uh, Spanish being spoken, say, say in New York. And you have a body of, of material from New York. And then you get Spanish spoken in Puerto Rico. Is there a kind of consistency across these two types? And if, you, and, and if there is, uh, what are some of the general characteristics which distinguish this, say, from a Creole language? In other words, I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in type. The, the, the typology of this kind of thing. I mean, I, I, at one point, uh, Chicano English was beginning to be to be studied in this way, and so you have a you have that type. So, so that so that I think the way one of the things that I'd be interested in is how we compare uh, the different kinds of Spanishes. How is it that it differs? from, say, Spanish by itself? How is it different from English by itself? In other words, how you can identify this as a type of linguistic phenomenon? And um, so that, that, that is, that, that's what's intriguing me at the moment. Right? And, and then, of course, the, the sort of theoretical frameworks within which you would analyze these, these things. There's a lot of literature on what, what defines a Creole. Defines a pigeon, what's not? What defines a mixed language, what's not? What defines this kind of linguistic phenomenon that you have in Spanish and, and Chicano English and so on? Mm -hmm. I think notions of identity have to, to, to come in. Oh, sure. Because they're, um, from the material you dis 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 distributed, notions of identity are quite palpable. I mean, these are balanced by linguists who decide under certain circumstances to, to use this Spanish. So yeah. these are all intriguing questions. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add another intriguing question? <laughs> um, what, have you encountered cases where um, Spanish, very fluent Spanish speakers, cannot really disentangle or, or remove English from their Spanish? So, so suppose they go to Spain and talk to somebody who does not speak English, and they are supposed to take out all the all the English. Does it ever happen that people are just not able to do? Because I know that my husband, because we speak Serblish all the time, but when we go back to Serbia, he he continues to mix uh, English into his Serbian, and then people look at him, <laughs> surprised. I remember when I was in 
was saying um, years ago, I saw Mark Anthony do an interview with a radio, or some TV station, and it was just Spanglish nonstop. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't help himself. He just, yes. yeah. That's, that's maybe when it becomes a language on its own. Yeah, that's, that's where it's. Yeah, you can. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. I remember showing a clip of him mm -hmm. to my students when we talk about Spanish. Mm -hmm. Because his case is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I know in Puerto Rico, this is beginning to change now a lot. But uh, uh, for many years, there were many strong prejudices against New Yorkans, right. generations of Puerto Ricans growing up in New York. And one of the ways you could spot them was that they were unable to then come fully into Spanish. Uh, they would always, uh, as hard as they try, slip uh, some English into it, or not be able to pronounce the word in, in Spanish, uh, with the Spanish pronunciation. There's a, I have to give you the, the exact name, but there's a wonderful video on YouTube of a New Yorker man uh, talking about his experience and why he speaks the way he does and why he speaks Spanish. And it's a beautiful account of what happened to him and how he had to juggle with these two languages, which unfortunately um, caused one of these comments that you have here that I just saw. I said, how can people say that? So in, in response to that video, there was a comment, an anonymous comment, by somebody saying, uh, this is on page three, this um, saying, I hate people who speak Spanish. They seem mentally retarded. Um, so people react um, very strongly about this mixture. It's usually either monolingual people uh, who don't, they don't even know what it is to live with two languages on a daily basis and use two languages on a daily basis and switch back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, but there are also uh, even linguists, <laughs> and I'll talk about this uh, in April, but that are attacking this way of talking. I think it's mostly for political reasons, but they are also afraid of um, Spanish losing 40 million speakers. And you know, but by the way, we never have 40 million speakers here. Huh? And we, we cannot lose what we didn't have to start with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now that the United States has, has more Hispanics than Spain? Oh, sorry, you were referring to the United States, but I thought that we understood. Yeah, now, now that the United States, I think, has 40 million Hispanics. Not all of them speak Spanish, uh, but their potential speakers of this mixture, and Spain has less than 40 million. So some people are starting to, it's the Spanish language that we, you know, we need to protect it because it might lose all these potential speakers. You know what I mean? It's, it's a worry. The, the Royal Academy is worried. The Instituto Cervantes is worried. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about 40 million people. We're not talking about um, how many speakers of media lingua did you say? 2,600. So, so media lingua has 2,600 speakers. Native speakers. Nobody is worried. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm media lingua. I was looking at number um, nine and number nine is a bit kind of catch for example. And I, I, I just, I just thought of uh, there's a Roma population in the Pyrenees who picked up Basque case but they put it on their uh, the, the Roma roots. But I'm just wondering, do you think it's going to shift to one language or another's derivational or inflectional morphology? Uh, how does that work? For this? Uh, uh, Spanish takes on more English morphology. Uh, English oh, you more. mean for Spanish? Yeah, well, how, does it, how does it tilt? Uh, well, it's interesting. In, uh, I like the quote by the comedian saying, I love Spanish twice the vocabulary, half the grammar. Yes. <laughs> Which I think is a very good way to put it because um, when they are mixing it in the way that, for instance, Susana Chavez Silverman does it, you, you choose the structures that are common to both languages, right? And so you're kind of choosing a particular type of grammar that the one that both languages share 
So I think that's what he means by half the grammar. Mm -hmm. But then you have lots of choices about which word to insert in there. So, and in many, most, I think, uh, maybe Walter knows more about this, but I think most mixed languages are split in that way, where one provides most of the lexicon and one provides uh, the grammar. In the case of media lengua, Quechua provides the grammar and um, Spanish provides the vocabulary. And uh, if I had to guess about Spanglish, um, I would say that they would choose the Spanish lexical items and um, probably most of the English grammar. Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't be a lot of subjunctive or uh, kind of non-English features, but that's just, do you have a guess about that? Or does anybody have a guess? I think that's an educated guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. We're all enjoying ourselves with yeah. this. Oh, yes. oh my God. Thank you. you know, it's a good talk, but nobody wants to leave. <laughs>